In this sequence of videos, we're going to discuss ring homomorphisms, some of their properties, and we're going to work a lot of examples. To get started, let's deal with the definition of a ring homomorphism. So a ring homomorphism phi from, rings, from a ring R to a ring S is one that whenever we pick any two arbitrary elements A and B in the first ring R, that phi of A plus B is equal to phi of A plus phi of B, and phi of A times B is equal to phi of A times phi of B. Now I'd like to, that's the formal definition, that's what you'd read in a book, but what I'd like to do is break this down and talk about how we should really internalize this definition. So first of all, remember that uh, rings are examples of groups. They're groups that have a whole bunch of additional structure on them. So if we forget about the fact for a minute that R and S happen to be rings and just think about them as groups, a ring homomorphism is just uh, in particular has to be a group homomorphism, so our group operation is addition. And so this first criteria that phi of the quantity a plus b needs to equal phi of a plus phi of b is the requirement that the map phi from r to s be a group homomorphism. Now, the thing that we added with the rings r and s is we added a multiplication structure to each of them. I've denoted the multiplication in each ring by a different operation, so I've used a little dot to denote the multiplication inside the ring R, and I've used a star to denote the multiplication inside of S. Um, this is not necessary. I don't think Galleon does this. However, sometimes it can just help you to distinguish. Uh, we don't require that they have the exact same multiplication structure, and so sometimes using a different symbol to indicate which is the multiplication in which ring can be helpful in terms of sorting things out. Um, as a side note from that, this second criteria, the phi of A times B is equal to phi of A times phi of B, is saying that the map phi also needs to respect the operation of multiplication that belongs to each of the individual rings. So we've got to be a group homomorphism. We have to respect the group structure of each of the rings. But now the new thing about being a ring is that we have this multiplication, and we want the map to respect this as well. So in summary, in other words, a ring homomorphism is a map between rings that knows that both objects are rings and is really trying to respect and capture that property. Note that just like with group homomorphisms, we don't require a ring homomorphism to be one-to-one, -one, or I'll sometimes say injective instead of one-to-one, -one, and we don't require that the ring homomorphism be onto, which I will sometimes call a surjective. So what we need are we need a few more definitions to capture what do we map onto and kind of how far away are we from being one to one. The first definition is the image of phi, said image of phi written I am of phi, and this is the collection of elements inside the ring S that are actually hit by some element of R. They're actually mapped to by an element of little r, um, element, uh, element little r of capital R. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to define the kernel of this map, written K-E-R of phi, kernel of phi. This is the set of ring elements inside the ring R that map to the additive identity of S, that map to zero. Remember, this is what really makes sense for us. Sometimes there can be a little bit of confusion between additive identity and multiplicative identity, but remember that in general we don't require rings to have a multiplicative identity. And so if we're gonna, we want to talk about ring homomorphisms for all types of rings, not just the ones that have a unity element. So our kernel of phi is going to coincide with the group theoretic definition of the kernel of a map, and it's going to be all of the things inside the original ring that map to the additive identity, the zero element of the ring S. Now the next thing we should do is look at some sort of elementary examples and one non-example that will hopefully be illuminating for us. So back in the beginning we've noticed since we started stu studying rings that somehow the ring of integers and the ring of integers mod n seem to be very similar. And when we came up with the idea of a subring, we toyed around with that idea as perhaps the ring of integers is a sub uh, the ring of integers mod n is a subring of the integers. And we discussed that that is incorrect. It is not true to say that z mod n is a subring of z. What is the correct way to describe the relationship and the similarity that we see between these rings is to say that the integers mod n 
is the homomorphic image of the integers. So meaning we have a surjective ring homomorphism from the integers to the integers mod n, which is this sort of natural map. It just takes an arbitrary integer and it reads it modulo n. It tells you what's the remainder of that element if I divide by n. That map is an example of a ring homomorphism. Now, to verify that this is actually a ring homomorphism, what we need to do is check that the two properties on the previous slide are satisfied. So we need to check that if we first add together two integers and then read the result modulo n, that this is the same as first reading the individual things we've added together modulo n and then performing the addition operation. Similarly, we need to check that for multiplication. So we need to say that if we have two integers, if we first multiply them and then read the result modulo n, this needs to be the same as reading each of the individual integers modulo n and then performing the multiplication. Um, however, this is, these are basic facts of modular arithmetic. Uh, we've been using both of these facts heavily for quite some time as we've moved through abstract algebra and group theory, uh, and you should have covered them uh, at the very beginning of an abstract algebra course um, within the first couple of weeks. For our next example, let's do something a little bit different. Let's take our ring R to be the polynomial ring where we're looking at polynomials with real coefficients. And let's let the ring S, the image, be the ring of real numbers. And let's define our map phi. How do we take a polynomial? What do we know? What real number to output? We'll take a polynomial and we'll output f of 0, where f of 0 is really just the constant term of the polynomial f. I claim that this map is a surjective ring homomorphism and that the kernel of this map is the ideal generated by x. So first let's justify that this is in fact a ring homomorphism. So what we need to check is that our operations of addition and multiplication are preserved. Where in the first ring we're doing polynomial addition and polynomial multiplication and in the second ring we're just doing usual addition and multiplication of real numbers. So let's take two arbitrary polynomials in the ring R. So we'll take a polynomial f and a polynomial g, and we'll write them out. So we'll say that f is a sub n x to the n, plus so on and so forth, plus a1 x plus a naught. And then we'll try and write the polynomial g as arbitrarily as possible as well. Uh, so we'll change all the a's to b's, and g need not have the same degree as f. So we'll just change the degree from an n to an m. And then we'll write g as b sub m x to the m, and so on and so forth. If we take the two polynomials f and g and add them together, then the constant term of this sum is a0 plus b0, which is precisely equal to what would have happened if we just took the constant term of f and added it to the constant term of g, uh, which is what this map phi is really doing, just take the constant term. Forget all the other things that are there in the polynomial and just take the constant term. Similarly, if I take the polynomial f and the polynomial g, and I want to multiply those two polynomials together, trying to figure out what some of the cross terms look like can be really annoying, and we would have to use this distributive property and this generalized foiling to figure out what the coefficients look like on some of those middle terms. However, it's very easy to figure out what the constant term of f times g would be. That constant term results from just multiplying the constant term of f by the constant term of g, which is exactly what we want to happen. If we first would have taken f and just replaced it with a0, taken g and replaced it with b0 and then done that multiplication, we would get a0 b0. And that does in fact turn out to be the constant term of the polynomial f times the polynomial g. So this should justify here that the map we've defined in this second example really and truly is a ring homomorphism. The last thing that we need to justify is what's the kernel of this map? So for this, what we need to think about is, first, let's suppose that the polynomial f happens to map to 0 inside of s. Then what this means is that the constant term of the polynomial f is 0. And that means that every other term that appears in the polynomial f contains a power, contains an x at least. And so we can factor out this x, and f can be written as x times some other polynomial inside the ring R. And that means that the polynomial f belongs to the ideal generated by x. 
So that shows us that if we have a polynomial and it maps to the zero element of s, then it belongs to the ideal generated by x. Something that belongs to the ideal generated by x is a multiple of x, and that means that it doesn't have any constant term, well, or that the constant term is zero alternatively, and that would certainly mean that it belongs to uh, the kernel of this map. Now one non-example that I think is very helpful here is let's take the ring R to be the same polynomial ring as the previous example, R joined X, and let's take the ring S to be the same. And let's talk about a map, phi, from R to S that takes a polynomial and maps it to its derivative. We should have discussed, or hopefully you did in an abstract algebra class, show that this is a group homomorphism. If we first add two polynomials together and then take their derivative, this is the same as taking the derivatives of the individual polynomials and then adding them together. Uh, derivatives behave nicely with respect to addition. However, derivatives do not play nicely, or the way that we automatically think that they would, according to multiplication. And this is, you know, we have the product rule for taking the derivative of the product of functions. Um, that is, you don't necessarily get your wish when you're looking at the product of polynomials. If you first take the product of two functions and then take their derivative, this is not the same as taking the derivative of each of the things individually and then just multiplying them together.